two, one. The Sofa Club is live. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this week's Peccadillo Sofa Club. I'm Martha, a uh, programmer from Fringe Queer Film and Arts Fest, here with Stud Life director Campbell X and stars Tania Miller and Robin Kerr. Um, and hopefully you can see them all right now. I don't know if you've been waiting on us to start. Um, people watching at home, you can ask questions on Instagram, Twitter, and also on the YouTube of this video. Use the hash Peccadillo Sofa Club if you want us to answer, ask your questions. Um, you all made Stud Life together uh, 10 years ago. When's the last time you saw it? Uh, uh, yeah. you, Robin, yeah. I know Robin saw it recently. Uh, I think maybe a year ago. <laughs> I think a year ago. Yeah, I watched it with a mate a year ago. Yeah. So that... <laughs> And you, and you, Robin, you saw it when last night? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to refresh my memory before the queue. Yeah. That would have been a wise choice, a wise decision. <laughs> <laughs> Any feelings yeah. brought up? How is it watching it again? Oh, she's frozen. Modern technology is great when it works. Yeah, when it works. Well, um, for me, I see different things every time, so that's always, you know, when, when you see your own work, the first time you see it, you can't see it really, and then each time you see it, different things are revealed, so that's what I see. I mean, it's easy to think of 2012 as very recent, but this is a time when British film was either like Love Actually or This Is England. So still about the diversity of white heterosexuals. Uh, were you conscious of that, Campbell? Um, and can you place your London on screen in a lineage with any other films? Um, do you think there are any? Hello. Or I'm so sorry. Uh, we have Robin back. No, no hey, worries. Girl. I'm so sorry. I'm in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> the internet is... Uh, uh, sketchy sketchy Love yeah sketchy it's just brilliant yeah. the way that we're here and we're kind of global right now um mm -hmm. and so there will be sort of technical hitches um to answer your question i think i think more diasporically around film i don't just think of london even though that film is very centred in London and very centred in East London and it uses the, you know, the lingo, the location, so you can recognise East London. Um, because I think very often the London that's promoted to other countries is central London, you mm. know, not, not the ghetto, <laughs> uh, except if it's gangster and it wasn't a gangster film. Um, so... Um, in relation to other films, it, it it's a comedy really. It's a it's a comedy that um, that happens to be queer, and it relates to kind of the lineage of British comedies. You yeah. Know, like and and the queerest I can think in that sort of vein um, would be. Um, for weddings and a funeral, even going as far back as that. Do you know what I mean? And and there have been so many clones of that film since. But um, just something grounded in a kind of urbane, modern London that's not twee, that's not Mary Poppins, you yeah. know, fantastical, that's not Notting Hill, whitewashed. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Even though, um, you know, Four Weddings was a bit whitewashed as well, but it... it, it, it Mm -hmm. At the time, it seemed quite radical. Yeah, no, I can see that. Um, and how do you... Uh, I mean, I think Stood Life is one of the first films I saw that represented a friendship between a gay man and a lesbian. Um, they're also a masculine AFAB person and a femme gay man. 
do you think that this kind of mix of genders changes what a gay film is, you know, from being something more formulaic, um, a gay male buddy comedy or a lesbian gang comedy? How, how do you think that changes it? Well, um, it changes it a lot because I think um, LGBT films tend to be segmented into either a lesbian film, which is like two women fall in love and they stroke each other. And they gaze at each <laughs> other in bed. You have to gaze in bed. Uh, well. I'm sorry. But, you know, there is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then two gay men meet each other and then they're like, rrr, 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 you know. But it's they, true though. They never it's stroke true. loving. So eloquent. There. <laughs> so eloquent, aren't they? And um, felt. you know, trans films ten tend to be set in the past. And it's mm. like a lot of them tend to be really tragic and very few yeah. are contemporary. There's lots of contemporary characters in TV, but not really in film. Mm-hmm. Except by Hook or Crook, which had was made ages ago now. Yeah, yeah. Fifty two um Tuesdays. Um so, and you know, it, you know, never mind intersex. You know. Yeah. So they, they, but they tend to be segmented because of markets. Because I think people think gay men only want to see films with men. You know, lesbians only want to right. see films with lesbians. And actually, I was sitting behind two lesbians or two women who were together. And when the sex scenes came on with the guys, they were like, "Oh my god, I thought I'd come to see a lesbian film." <laughs> <It's-> <laughs> <they're> not- <laughs> Some audiences are regimented and others are not. It's true. And, mm. and we see this with Fringe all the time that like gay men will buy a ticket to a, a trans film and vice versa. I mean, that's another thing because um, Stood Life is one of the first films that centered a masculine of center person. And, and you've spoken a bit about that before. I wanted to know whether that affected how hard or easy it was to get the film made and to get it funded. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tania's eyebrows. Um, cut to Tania. <laughs> cut to Tania. Uh, it wasn't funded. It wasn't funded. Right. Um, I applied for finance um, and I was told there wasn't an audience for this film. So um, <sighs> I decided to do a table read with um, some actors and um, they um, encouraged me to continue, so I did. And then um, Tania came for an audition. I was at the table read. You were at one of the table reads, that's correct. Yeah, yes, with Martina Laird. La- 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 Martina Laird. La- 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 an amazing La- actor. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm blessed to know beautiful and wonderful and talented actors. Yeah. Um, so when um, Tania was at the table read but then came to the audition because for the audition I wanted a specific vibe of you know masculine of center but vulnerable because I think when masculine of center is played often it's this kind of like kind of stiff sort of persona not sensual not vulnerable and um to me I killed the audition the same with Robin when Robin came for the audition and Robin I don't know if you remember that day because I didn't know but you weren't feeling very well yeah, I was cold. very you ill. Really yeah, Ill. I was really ill. And it was because of Tania why I even knew about this film because she. Oh, yeah. She, yeah. 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 You put me forward. That's right. And that's how I knew about it. Yeah. Yeah. But I was, yeah, I was, I was really sick, but I was like, I, I, I had to get her. <laughs> and then you apologized because you had a cold and you were kissing me. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah so it was and, and what because I was getting Tania killed the role and I was just like okay I've got the character of JJ I've got the actor for JJ yeah. but it was very very difficult to get the role for Elle because I was looking for a woman who was young who could play active desire mm and feminine to play active design. I don't know if you remember, Robin, I was like saying how, like show show desire, show desire for JJ. And very few people could do it. It was so incredible. People kept saying, I don't know how to show it. I know how to be desired, 
but I don't know how to show mm -hmm. desire. And um, I was despairing until Robin came to the audition and Robin just mm -hmm. absolutely smashed it. And I just thought, and there was chemistry between Robin and Tania, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So I felt blessed to have both of them, you know, kind of meshed. In the, in it's, the a great, it's a great pairing. Um, yeah, how and How was it for both of you, this journey of uh, embodying these roles? Um, Campbell cracked the whip. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, it's, it, was, it was, for me, it was a great journey in that uh, I didn't have any masculine centered friends. Um, I, people say I come across as femme presenting, you know, quite feminine. Um, that's what people say. I don't necessarily always agree with that. Um, but anyway, at the time, um, we went for, we had some rehearsals, didn't we? We had I think, two or three weeks of rehearsals mm -hmm. and, um, and decided to go method with it. And so I uh, went out and got some clothes and I uh, strapped down and I sort of just tried to live in her. In her and life. you got the fade. Or may I come to the fade, Lord of Moscow. So I come well, I mean about active. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Campbell, he sent me to go to the barbers and I come back with it. He said, he said to me, you need a boy's haircut. Okay, okay. Because I, you know, this is I've been my haircut for the last <clears throat> how many years. And uh, so I went to the barbers and I come back and he would say, it's still not masculine enough. It's too feminine. It's too feminine. And I think I, I got it right from the fourth or fifth cut. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. But so, yeah, <laughs> there was a, it was a journey with the hair and the clothes and and, and binding and all of this stuff. And what was really interesting is, is I looked like a young boy. I looked a lot younger for my age. I looked like this young boy. And I suddenly then realised what it was like to live in a, to be perceived in a male, a young male's body. And that changed the way everybody else treated me. And so that was the biggest revelation in terms of that really informed how I then played JJ. And I think that going back to what you said earlier, Campbell, about um, that vulnerability, if you have lived in that body and presented that way for many years, I understand why you wouldn't have that place, be able to show that vulnerability. If that's, you know, because mm. you have to fucking have your guard up all the time, you're either ignored or you're suspected, you know, people treat you with a, this is the mass general public with a degree of suspicion and I think after three days just three days of um living in JJ's body while we were in rehearsals I went from being this really beautiful light spiritual I love everybody everyone's great the world is fine to I want to pump somebody if I get barge out of the way again if I have another woman just you know holding a handbag clutching a handbag just because I'm passing this like, how the fuck do I deal with this how do I um? How do I look at this anger and address this anger and these feelings? Because that person, that angry person, is not me. And so I were, as the says to you, and I would say, "Good morning, mum," in my best RP, and uh, move out of the way, you know, quite completely before anyone else <laughs> fucking budge me to make a point, you know. And that's how I was able to exist. But that's because I've had that experience before. Yeah, you know, living as Tania, so. Uh, yeah, that was my journey into getting into into JJ. But she was a lot of fun. I have to say that, man, I had my pick. I had hetero girls <laughs> hitting on me. I had gay boys hitting on me. I had everybody hitting on me. I was like, ooh, <laughs> this is nice. People yeah, so were I experienced desire in a very different way as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also you had to face that fear of inhabiting particular kind of masculinity didn't you mm. to be able to walk um walk that walk which I think showed your strength as an actor because I think a lot of actresses who do masculine of center roles they still hold on to a kind of femininity so that people will think oh you know I'm not I'm not really like that no don't you know it, just in case you think I'm like that I'm not so they hold back a little bit and well, then there's a bit of part. fakeness. Well, but you and, and that's what gets me with you know with, with, with you know if you're gonna do it, do it. Yeah. 
uh, if you're going to smoke a cigarette on the fucking screen, fucking smoke a cigarette, whatever it is, you're going to make a cup of tea, make the fucking cup of tea, whatever it is, um, when it comes to character work. And I think, you know, Robin is very much like this as well, you know, because we've, yes. from our conversations in the past, that if you're going to do it, then you, mm. you commit to the story. Because yeah. ultimately, everything that we play, it's not about us as the actors, or the individual, it's, exactly. it's about honouring the story. And honouring the role. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. How did you that's become a bit. And telling, telling the truth, like the tr- every moment I felt like we tried to just tell the truth. And I think that's why that rehearsal time was because we could build up the depth and that and the, we had a very strong foundation coming in. And I certainly felt so connected to Nia before we even started. And also like, because she had done the work she had done, I also felt like, even when the camera wasn't rolling, I felt like, I mean, she was being such a gentleman. I was like, man, this is, this is my, and I'm, I'm not a gay woman, but let me tell you, boy, I was really wishing I could be. I was like. <laughs> we obviously didn't work on you hard enough, Robin. <laughs> I was like, if this is, this is what I, this is how I want to be treated. This is how I want to be treated. A part of me fell in love with JJ. Like that's oh I love JJ. <laughs> <laughs> and I love and I love Elle because Elle got like I got to be somebody who's very far away from who I am as a person. And I was I'm not a very sexually confident person. I don't exist in the world in that way. I kind of I'm more of a person who apologizes for my existence in the world. And Elle is just so, here I fucking am. This is who I am. And if you don't like it, well, fuck you. You're missing out. And she was just brave and bold. And it was so much fucking fun to be her. Yeah. Um, yes. I wanted to... It's fun. <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to talk about that fun, actually, because you can sense that in the performances and the pacing of it. Um that you had so much fun making this film. Um, there's a few familiar faces in there. I had forgotten that Miss Kimberly's in it uh, at the start, and I love that bit. I f- think Della Grace Volcano is maybe yeah. in it. Yeah, and um, Larson Perlman, Stella Duffy, you know, there are lots of cameos from, from us. And then there's yeah. this wonderful Donya Kroll, who's in the barbershop, mm. you know, Theo Okundupe, you, yeah. know, there, yeah. and, you know, Dean Atta, who's a writer. So it, it's kind of a lot of us is in it as well and the allies who came to kind of support the film. Where, um, where were the I party? love how much Caribbean stuff is in it. Sorry, I know that's yeah. like a separate thing. No, it's not. <laughs> no, Coming oh, from a Caribbean part. background. Or, yeah, I mean, it's part. Coming from a Caribbean background and being, I so rarely, especially now that I live in America, it's a different thing, but it's, to work with other people with Caribbean background. Oh my gosh, it was like, it was coming home. It was yeah. wonderful. There's a shortcut, isn't there? It's just, there's just a shortcut. You know, and, it was simple. Mm, mm, yeah. Mm. And also you were able mm-hmm. to use a lot of the, um, the uh, what you call the, the um, pat, you were able to use patois and the gutturals. Like when you said, mood gone, you know, we don't yeah, hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And the way you said it, obviously, was very authentic. It was like you. And um, I loved the little moments that you gave, you know, Elle with that language and, and bringing that in. Maybe. Um, I have some questions from members of the public now. Oh, if, okay. if you want to. Hello, members of the public. Hello, members yeah, of the public. So many Hello. members of the public, your public, um, asking things like uh, so, a question from um, Morgan is how important was it to have bits of comedy to diffuse the tension of the violence depicted? And uh, in this, they mean the, the sort of hate crime uh, violence experienced by JJ. Yeah. That's a really good question. I actually, weirdly enough, didn't write it as a comedy. It was Stella Nuimo, the producer, who said, I laughed. I kept turning the page and laughing. 
So did you? Oh, your reaction, you were like, yeah, I was like, <laughs> sort of comedy. I was like, oh, you're a die, you're. <laughs> I know, I know. I was wrong. She's right. She's always right. Um, <laughs> so um, that was brought out with um, the editing and the actors and their reactions. It, I think it was quite um, organic, the, the comedy aspect, and that helped with the violence, because actually I wanted to show violence in the film as a theme, violence that was non-consensual as the hate crime, and violence that was consensual as in the BDSM scenes, yeah? Because we, we have to differentiate between when people agree to do certain things as opposed to when um, violence is acted on them in, in a hateful way. And so I was trying to show the balance of that um, throughout the film. So thanks for that question. Really good. Well, it seems the toilet scene, when I watched it again this time, uh, yeah. seems to foreground the violence, which seems to foreground some of the SM. And you, you see the body feature heavily um, as a kind of public object, as a gendered object. Um, how intentional was that focus for you, Campbell? Uh, all my films are about the body. They're about black queer bodies and um, not just violence, but also desire and joy, because I think we don't see enough of black sensuality, black joy, um, black tenderness. And so I wanted to bring all those elements in, you know, and also there's an assumption that if you speak a certain way, you have certain attitudes. So it was deliberate that the hairdresser who spoke raw patois was the one who defended JJ against the homophobes. And she was older mm -hmm. and the homophobes were young, young guys and mm -hmm. they're usually young guys anyway. So um, it's like getting people to come out of um, preconceived assumptions about blackness, about uh African descent people, about Caribbean people in relation to um, homophobia and also um, desire, because it's not that straightforward, you know. Mm. I like to complicate things, really. Well, that's, that's the London that you've been in, isn't it, as well? Yeah, and London um, is complex, and London is beautiful mm -hmm. and mixed and oh, it's incredible. So yeah, <laughs> it's incredible. What what were the responses to the film uh, when it first came out in, in uh, San, uh, San Francisco and, and what were the responses to kind yeah. of the London that we actually inhabit? Um, well, it, the, the film first screened in, in Los Angeles in the Egyptian theatre, which um, is on Hollywood. It's in Hollywood. Um, it's a massive, massive iconic cinema and I was actually freaking out because it was the first time it was ever, ever, ever shown um, to any mass audience. And it was in a foreign country. And, you know, you had Elle speaking Patois, you know, Seb speaking London Patois, JJ speaking Patois. I thought, you know, people are not going to get this film. And it opened, it opened Fusion Film Festival in LA. And um, from the first frames people started laughing screaming um shouting at the screen because it was a very <laughs> multicultural audience which oh, I relish that so much when people just talk back yeah. to the screen it's so beautiful to me I know certain people don't like that they don't even want you to breathe in the cinema I'm just like throw things that's Tania don't sit <laughs> next to me <laughs> um, <laughs> I know but they were just they got completely <coughs> into it and I was so relieved that they got it but I think it's because the themes are quite universal and quite universally queer but also quite universally human as well um, because some cis straight guys have come up to me and told me that they relate to the character of JJ mm -hmm. uh, and in relation to Elle so um and then when it premiered in London, and all these audiences are sold out audiences that it, it screened yeah. at. And then it screened out, it, 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 it's, it, it was screened at the BFI Flair, yeah. and it was sold out again, and there were, you know, queues around the yeah, building. Yeah, three days of that, right? Yeah, to get in. It's amazing. It's amazing. They had that wild after party, can you remember? 
<laughs> it was mental. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, everywhere it was screened, it was very well received by um, audiences. Um, how it was received by critics was mixed. Some people really loved it and some people were like, I don't get these people um, and didn't like it. But that's, I think, the nature of filmmaking. Not everybody's going to like your film and it generates debate as well, generates debate. You know? I suppose, especially mm -hmm. when it's a new perspective, um, yeah. which it's, it's, it still was. Um, we have a question from, from Rochelle, which is... Hi, Rochelle. Um, Hi, Rochelle. Oh, yeah. oh, oh! Actually, that's that's pretty much about about this. Uh, how is London received? A uh, similar question. Um, Morgan asks, uh, with the increased visibility of trans and non-binary people, do you think JJ might ident identify differently if uh, the film were meant today? Um, what do you think about this that's question? That's a question I have actually. I was like, I wonder. Mm -hmm. I wonder. I wonder. Um, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a good question, but I think we have to remember that there are people who are assigned female at birth who are masculine center and are studs, you know, and they might use male pronouns, but they're still studs. So, but they still um, consider themselves within the, 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 the spectrum of wo womanhood. And yeah. I think we need to honor that, actually, um, you know, if I was to write a character now, I might write a character that was more non-binary trans. But JJ is, mm -hmm. um, let, it, let JJ represent a particular kind of womanhood, which is masculine, which might use he as a pronoun, might use they as a pronoun, but doesn't de define as non-binary, defines as a stud. And, um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's important um, mm -hmm. because those people exist. That's right. Um, Christiane asks everyone, how have you been staying creative during lockdown? <gasps> Big question on everyone's lips at the moment. Go Who's on, going on? Go on, baby. Not for a while. Go on, what have you been doing? Show them all your um, booze. <laughs> all your booze. She's been having it on the, on the bottle. Well, um, I'm in Serbia right now. <laughs> and all the borders are closed here and my internet barely works. So... <laughs> Um, I mean, my niece has been doing a lot of stop motion videos. That's been really fun. She's 10 years old and she's been doing stop motion videos in English, <laughs> which has been amazing because that she's, she speaks Serbian and, um, I'm working on doing a, a Serbian stop motion to send to her. That's as creative as I've gotten. <laughs> how, how, do you, man. <laughs> how do you say hello in Serbian then? Zdravo. 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 Okay. You can all add that to your... Um, Zdravo. Your, That's going on the CV now. Yeah. Skills list. Yeah, I know, right. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I could do Serbian. How many... How many Serbian people look like this, right? Like, hey, there's you're a one, flash, man. Yeah. There's a <laughs> you're, you're one of them. <laughs> I have been making house. So we we um, I came to LA just before the lockdown started, and then it's sort of in between here and the UK anyway. Um, but we have moved three times. Oh. And uh, yeah. And the, next, the last place, that this place that we're in now, um, came unfurnished. So I have been trying to make it homely by making pom-pom rugs and crocheting. Led to crocheting. So that's Oh, fun. yeah. Um, <laughs> knitting and cooking well. a lot. I, I mean, yeah. You've been like Madame Defarge. This, but she was I am like a CD homemaker right now. I'm going to tell you. Everything's like wool. <laughs> But isn't it nice though? Because sometimes, like, it's just—I mean, as nice as it can be under the circumstances. But sometimes with this job, you have to move around a lot, and your life is often not your. And you know, I—I—I I, I haven't had. I, I live in New York, and I—I I think we've been trying to get our apartment finished for five years. 
Wow. There's just never any time because yeah. you're off. Like I, I work a lot out of town. So I'm on a, you know, I'm working in Idaho. I'm working in Syracuse. I'm working at, you know, and so it's to make a home. You, you forget how precious that is. Yeah, it's been fun. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, I'm sort of over it now. Um, as of last week, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm done with this lockdown. And I feel isolation is something that I think many actors live with, like you say, all, all the time. I saw my house in London for three months last year, um, and it was an eight-month gap before that. So living in isolation is something that I think we're kind of used to. And I'm such a homebody that I very rarely go out. Um, and then if I do, then I have it large. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I'm done. I, I'm done with this lockdown. I'm, you know, I just, I want to go out and eat now and, and play. <laughs> Um, lots of people in the chat are talking about the soundtrack of the film. Jay has said um, it was a pleasure to get involved. Um, they, Hi, Jay. I, I think we're involved in music. And Hi, Jay. Hi, Jay. Um, yeah, Absolutely. lots of people talking about the soundtrack, praising it. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. Um, that, yeah. that was chosen again for um, somebody's mentioned that my film um, produces queer archives. So a lot of the musicians in the soundtrack of the film are um, queer and queer people of color. The composer is a, a trans woman, um, mm. Jessica Lawrence. So I, I tend to use people like, it's not just diverse in front of the, the, the camera, but also diverse behind the camera. Which doesn't and, happen a lot, just want to interject that. Yeah, does not happen a lot. To this date, this is the most diverse group of people wow. I've ever worked with. And that's 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Uh, so but, how about, the, did, yeah. uh, did any of you think you would be still talking about this film? It would still be touching audiences 10 years later. This is a question from Lexi online. Hi, Lexi. Um, Hi, Lexi. <laughs> I, like uh, I I didn't have any idea what when you make something you just think okay I've done it now and like a weight is off your shoulders do you know what I mean um, what I didn't think was that I felt so blessed to have such beautiful, beautiful cast and crew. I mean, it was a magical moment. And here we are. I'm just looking at Denise and Robin, and all I can feel is just love, just love in my heart, yeah. you know, and just remembering. We, we shot this film in 10 days. <laughs> it was brutal. And, you know, they are very sweet, you know. But it was, it was 10 days. Very often we couldn't go for another take because it was just like, we've got to move on or... The police are coming. <laughs> 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 can, can you remember when that? Remember when the woman was ringing the police on us that time? Oh my god! Anyway, so <laughs> so. But we were all in it together. It was like this. Yeah. This massive, wonderful it family. Yeah. It, it was, was a very tight. tight um, you know, yeah. crew and cast and. I, I, I hope I can replicate that experience again, but it shows you that you can have that in a diverse, like this industry can be diverse and loving, whereas a lot of times you hear very um, conflictual or dysfunctional stories. Do you know what I mean? But this shows that, that we can do it. And not everybody on the crew was experienced. I, I brought some people on as trainees and, you know, they manage to get jobs after because I like to do that as well. Because how do we get work but by working in the first place yeah. and having some mm -hmm. CV? That's very important mm -hmm. to me um, because I, I know it, it, I, I had to break into the industry as well. So I, I don't want to be another person that creates another barrier to other people's access to, um, to this very nepotistic um, and excluding industry. I have to say that we belong to. So, yeah. yeah, I didn't no. think we'd be talking about it, no. But you know, some people who were 10 
10 years ago are now 20. It's true. That is, that yeah. is true. I, when <laughs> I think about that, they were kids. They wouldn't have been able to watch it, and now they can. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I, Robin, <it's> like. <laughs> I remember seeing uh, this film as the, the, the film with people of colour that you would see in the back of Diva magazine. So it was the, the main film that you would see that was people of colour, and, it, oh. and was that for ages. Um, yeah. So a beacon of hope to to out here in the sticks. Um, I wanted to ask actually where the where it was filmed. Uh, some bits of like the canal are familiar. I wanted to know where the parties were filmed and stuff. How how did you find the space to do this? Oh yeah, um, I, I love those party scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Austin superstar, big out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dawson Superstore was where we where the club was, and um, also the Oak Bar was the exterior. Dawson Superstore mm. was the interior for some, and then the Ro the Roxy no Troxy was the toilets were in Troxy, um, and uh, where else? We filmed around Limehouse, you know, the canal mm. scene. We filmed in Shoreditch. Uh, Bethnal Green and Victoria and Limehouse Park. Limehouse is the apartment, right? As well. Yeah, the apartment was in Limehouse yeah. as well. The posh apartment, Elle's apartment, was in Limehouse. Yeah, that was something else, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, I remember it incredibly well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course you do. Yeah, that was a sex scene. Was in in Limehouse. Yeah, but it was it was a sex scene. It was also very very intimate scenes that I I just I mean I get asked about that from friends or people who've watched the film like asking about I, I to create an environment where you're so you feel so comfortable and so safe that you can allow yourself to be vulnerable. Um. I felt like that, that, that felt rare to me. And I had Thank never you. done anything like that before as, as well. And I, I felt completely safe. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I did take cocoa, didn't I, on your head? What? That slapping, oh, remember? Oh, and we, and oh yes, yes. Put yes, that right, ring on. It, and I it, and I was like, are you sure? It's like, I'm so yeah. sorry, I'm so sorry. From the... Yeah, the big lump on your head, you have to hide it with your hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tricks of the trade. Like, do it, do it. I know, oh, but the thing is, <laughs> what's really sweet about Tania and Robin is, uh, you know, we like that was like you say things between you as actors that I I don't know until way after about the cocoa on your head, right? So. But it's the lengths that you wanted to go to to make it feel real. You know what I mean? To make it seem authentic and, you know, the awkward sex scene. And, and I like an awkward sex scene um, that you both pulled off so beautifully. And people do talk about that sex scene. I, I, wow. I appreciate the, the work that you did on that because, you know, the BDSM ones were more performative as BDSM can be sometimes, but the, the tenderness and care you brought to that awkward scene, which was so painful around, you know, issues around the body and desire, for me, they were out of this world, you know, and I've never seen anything like that, and there wasn't any staring into the eyes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but you know in fact there was looking away you know there was looking away and I, I just thought I, I thought you, you both did a beautiful job so thank you thank you thanks mate. um with thank you. with the uh, sm content of the film um you once again kind of reverse the expectation you have your femme initiating you know which is gorgeous we can um you know bottom can initiate femmes can initiate we can all teach each other um, and later on, the SM is used quite explicitly to create trust. Um, you know, Elle needs to know she can trust JJ before letting them know she's a sex worker. Um, how was the decision to include uh, SM and how you were going to include it? How was that, um, how was that approach for you, Campbell? Um, Martha, Martha, Martha. <laughs> 
how was that for me? Um, I, was, I, I think it's important for me to um, have the issue of power and um, okay. control and roughness in um, assigned female at birth kind of sex. Because very, very often when you see men having sex with men, it's very animalistic, as if animalistic sex is inherent to masculinity and in a cis right. man's body, yeah? And it's not, it's mm -hmm. such bullshit. It's not a gendered thing. We need to get away from the thing. That's why I say the things about the stroking and staring, because it, it, it appears as if um, sexuality within um, people who've been assigned uh, female at birth, who are, are, are women identified, it has to be gentle, not that it can't, mm -hmm. it can be all things, just like it can be tender between men, and it was tender in the end between Seb and Smackjack, okay? So I wanted to show you, you can have a, a diversity of sexual experiences, one. The other thing, there's a there's kind of dominant idea that um, Black people are very conservative around sex and sexuality and can't be freaky. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, and, and I'm just like, nah, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that one, darling. We're going to show that we are also of the flesh because we have been taught to be ashamed of sex and sexuality <laughs> because our sexuality was controlled by um, slave owners, by colonizers controlled our bodies owned our bodies till we didn't know who our bodies were and I want us to reclaim everything about our bodies and, and represent that as well and particularly in a, in a queer centric um, kind of representation um, and, and, and not just limit it to whiteness and, and white bodies you know we can have everything as, as black people you know whether you're trans or cis or you know, non-binary. That's a really great phrase. We can have everything as black people. It's a, that's yeah. an important phrase. We can um, have all the things. <laughs> um, it feels like in Stud Life, um, you foreground a lot of discussions that have now become commonplace amongst queer people. Um, kink, sex work, and, and all sorts of intersections present in the lives of queers in this city. Um, oh, I'm being told we're having a lot of snaps online for you. Um, oh, for this ah. A lot of enthusiastic <laughs> snaps from the <laughs> yeah. world out there. That's so cool. Thank you, people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, how, what do you think of how these conversations have developed in, in the, well, the 10 years since you made the film, let's say? It's quite interesting because, um, you know, to include sex work in a film was, um, you know, because people always go, oh, black women, all we get to do is play prostitutes, you know, that kind of way. And I often think, yeah, but some black women are prostitutes, but it's, it's not the playing of the prostitutes, it's how that experience becomes um, sidelined and one dimensional within the representation of dominant cinema. Right. So um, queerness and sex work are interlinked. Our bars were in red light areas until we became gentrified. Do you know what I mean? Many of um, our lovers are sex workers. And so I was able to um, do research amongst people who, who are sex workers, who are, who are in lesbian relationships, and the issues that came up for them when they revealed to their lovers Mm. that they that they were sex workers and what that meant and how that felt rather than having a politically correct idea of what the response should be as opposed to what they experienced when they revealed it and how people then negotiated and managed the relationships after the revelation so mm. you know JJ is not a very um JJ is not that evolved Emotionally or intellectually, sorry, Tania. Oh! <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> Not you, Tania, JJ. Um, but Elle was, is very advanced. And you could see by the books in her bookshelf, you know, she had um, books by Patrick Califia. If people look very carefully on her bookshelf, 
there were quite a lot of books. So Elle is very au fait with things around gender and sexuality. And JJ is very emotional and intuitive. So when they have that conversation, of course JJ is jealous. This is a natural reaction. You mm. can't pretend not to be. And, and also it's a drama. So if JJ was like, yeah, fine, there's no drama, you know, and that's, you know, in, in all films, there has to be that hint of what are they going to do now, now that that's been brought up. Um, Robin, I, to say something. Can I add to that as well, what you're saying about, about sex workers as well? Often I feel like there's this thing where they need to be saved from the life that they're in. Mm. And somehow they had no other choice and there is and I never thought of Elle's not she takes ownership of what she does she found you know she says it I knew what I could do with my black body and then this is what what I I, she takes ownership of it and she's in control of it and there is nothing weak or she, she doesn't need to be saved in any way and I know that that can she could come across as very brash yeah I think a, a a lot of people were very afraid of the L character. I have to say, her life. <laughs> I think. Um, sorry, Dolly, it, it sort of cut out, so I might have spoken over you. But a lot of people were very scared of the L character, and I think because we're not used to seeing a black, feminine, queer woman who takes control of her sexuality, we're just not used to it. We're not used to seeing it represented in TV, in, in film. And, um, you know, Robin brought that energy to it. And um, and I wish we saw more femmes, you know, not feminine women, but femmes represented in, in film and TV. That would be so amazing. I look forward to that. Um, I have some more questions from the real world out there. Oh, um, okay. Dale asks Campbell how much of yourself is in the film and also how did you um, and also Ruth asks how did you manage to organize the shoots to get what you needed from the cast so that when you you know so you could shoot in 10 days <laughs> hi Dale Dale's an amazing filmmaker I executive produced two of his films um, don't blame Jack and Everything is Flowers, which is just finished. Amazing filmmaker. Um, so hi. Um, there is one character in the film that's me, but nobody ever guesses it at all. And um, but do you want to guess, Martha? <laughs> I was just thinking the, the woman in the barbershop. <laughs> no. Um, no, no. No, no, no. Uh, no, I don't think... <laughs> The character who closely resembles me is Smack Jack, um, apart from the drug dealing. And funnily enough, is my mother's favorite character, so I'm very happy about that. Um, <laughs> and she likes him because he quoted Shakespeare, my mother um, was an English teacher. So, um, and he is an outsider. He, he's the one that's kind of outside the, the, the triad of um, L, J, J, and Seb. And he's trying to get in with them all the time. If you notice, he's trying to get in, he, he's a romantic, wants to love and be loved, you know, in this kind of pure idealistic way. And um, eventually he does. I, I created a happy ending. Nobody dies, in the spoiler alert, nobody dies. Um, so, but everybody in the film, obviously I've come across in life. You know, I've come across people like Elle. I've come across people like JJ. I've come across, you know, white people like Seb who can chat patois and always got hot sauce in their bag. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Kyle always had hot sauce in his bag. He did. He did, didn't he? he did. Oh my God, <laughs> and, you know, um, and, and he ad libbed <laughs> a lot of the slang as well. You know, yeah. so, so it, because London is like that, it's, it's, yeah very much now a potpourri, a soup of amazing wonderment and mix, which, why, which is why I think it's so hated by the right wing and the people outside, because it shows actually we can live together and we can create beautiful things and, you know, kind of beautiful culture. That's what I love so much about London. I miss it. I miss it so much. 
Yeah, London is oh. special. It's, it is like a different country. So, and there was it a lot of... Be my home. Oh. Always. And then there's a question from Ruth, you said? Um, Ruth's question was, how did you manage to organise the shoots to uh -huh. shoot so quickly, get everything you want from everyone, get everyone together and all of that? Um, and I'm hoping that's Ruth Holder, who's also another wonderful filmmaker um, and who I mentored um, in making her first film, dance film. So um, I organised getting the actors and the crew, but the, the mechanics of it was done by Lulu Bellevue, who people might Lulu. know. Wonderful Lulu. Um, and a lot of the props came through Lulu's connections, actually. A lot of the books that we use, we got permission. A lot of the um, sex toys, it was all Lulu. Amazing. I've noticed a lot of um, photograph prints. Like, is it, uh, I don't know uh, which lesbian photographers they are, Posner or uh, someone? Yes. It looks like someone's collection. That's correct, because I want to put us in it, us yeah. in the work, so that people know we are here. There was Della Grace's um, uh, photography as well, one with Dread, who um, sadly has passed away, and uh, Melissa Jo Smith. So these, all these names are actual people that, you know, who are filmmakers, who are artists, who, even if they're not in the film, their representation is in the film. Um, and, you know, wonderful Stella Nuimo organised, you know, kept us all on you know on time beautifully um, yeah beautifully yeah yeah beautifully. Yes. 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 Ella is incredible she's an incredible being she is a blessing mm. actually and uh and and Stella helped to organize the post-production and raising finance post-production mm. because um I'd raised money for the shoot from crowdfunding and private investment and then um, she helped raise money um, for um, the, the post-production of the shoot and, and organising that as well. So the mechanics and all those, I, I, I left that to other people so I could concentrate on the acting. We only had one pickup, didn't we? Yeah, mm -hmm. one pickup. Yeah, and that was just a continuity thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, everybody it else looks like, like um, oh. It looks like Stella might be watching right now. We're not sure if it's that Stella. Hi, Stella. Uh, hi. Hi, hi, Stella. Hi, Stella. Hi, Stella. We love you. We love you, Stella. We love you. We do. Yes. <laughs> I've spoken to Stella virtually every day since the shoot. We speak to each other. Ten years. And, and we're working, oh, yeah, wow. yes, and we're working on another um, film together, quite a few other projects together. So, um, yeah. Anything you can tell us about? I can I say. Oh. <laughs> on, until until we've signed on the dotted line. It's a bit like that, isn't it? We'll look uh, forward to it. Oh, uh, Stella's just, uh, Stella has said that the sausage was the pickup. It's uh, <laughs> cryptic to me, but I'm guessing you know what it is. Oh, I, there's a sausage that Tania picks up. Picks up. And you were like, Tania, can you remember the sausage? It is Stella Nuima. And you you were like, I'm not touching the pork. If it's a pork sausage, I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. Pork. And I was like, not no, this it's way. vegan. Not it's vegan. <laughs> Stella, was it pork? think about the sausage, it was cooked, yeah. It was, it was it pork? Was it it pork? wasn't pork. No, because, because we, don't, we don't give you black person to touch pork. What do you think I am? What do you think I am? It wasn't in that, you know, you had so many hats on. I had so many hats. <laughs> <laughs> so many things. I don't know if you know who, 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 who went and bought the sausage, you know? You know? That is thing. You didn't buy it and cook it yourself. So, you know, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't lose these people. Uh, hey. <laughs> I didn't cook it, but it was cooked. And it was to represent mass production. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh my god. Perfect. <laughs> oh, mass produced yeah. phone, mass produced devices for us. Yeah. Oh, it was to represent the mass production of, you know, consumer culture. Because, you know, when you say like sausage, sausage, oh, anyway, whatever. It was symbolic, <laughs> Ella. Now <laughs> it. An artistic choice. Artistic license. It's a beautiful choice.
Um, we have a question from Rochelle who says, do you think it would be easier for you to pitch the film now, nowadays? Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's not a question for me, but hell yeah. No, but to me, a few picture will be really effective as well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yeah. can I talk about this, Campbell? Pitch, pitch. Yeah, or well, not pitch, but um, from it, you know, from we first made it, I was like, this needs to be a TV series, and I think now mm -hmm. is an opportune time. Obviously, um, the dearest Robin here, who is stunning as always, but and I are, are too old to play JJ and L. But perhaps we can play their mothers. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I do think that now will be a great time. Yeah. to actually do this as a, as a TV show. So send in some yeah. ideas for episodes, guys, if you're watching. Yeah. Send them in. Um, and, and, it, and it will happen. Yeah. Mark, mark my word, it, that, that, that will happen when he talks about it now. I think um, as a TV series, it would do better now because TV's hot. Yeah. In the 10 years yeah. that happened, you know, TV's where it's at. And, you know, weirdly enough, um, we got a distribution with Netflix when Netflix was just starting out. Mm. So, you know, um, and, and, and it Netflix seemed US, kind right? of, yeah, US. Yeah. And it seemed like this strange thing. Oh my God, you've got this streaming and the film's going to be streaming. That was 10 years, you know, that wasn't, that was 20, 2012, right? Mm. So it's, you know, when it was, re when it was released, it got picked up by an American distributor who then um, sold it to Netflix. And, mm. It seemed such an innocent time then when Netflix mm. was really doing a lot of queer work, you know. Yeah. I mean, it still is now, but it, it, for a new company, it started off queer, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. I also, it, I still feel yeah. like, also, there's still so many people in this film that I feel are still underrepresented even 10 years on. So... Mm. I feel like we. Ah, she's about uh, to. Robin's. <laughs> we. She's gone. Robin's, Robin's in Siberia. Oh, no, Ro <laughs> well, uh, apparently a lot of people chatting along at home are showing love for the idea of a TV show. I can imagine it being huge. I, th I feel like we have. Yeah, there's there's a whole whole lives to still go on screen in that idea. I think. Um, wow! Well, exactly. If there's any TV people watching, let's talk, baby. Let's talk. Let's talk, as they say. <laughs> um, I missed a a few questions here, so I'm just going to go through them and see if anything's not been covered. Um, Jamie asked where the idea for the film came from and the initial idea of the characters. Okay. Um. Thanks, Jamie. Hi. Uh, the idea came, actually was inspired, I, I, around that time, there wasn't any representation of masculine or centre people in film or television who were, who were black, yeah? And, um, and dark-skinned as well, because that's quite important, not just black. And, um, but they were on YouTube. And I used to watch YouTube over and over again, seeing these people. I was fascinated because I was thinking they're taking control, taking yeah. control of representation, which is something that often we don't talk about. We don't talk about that. We, it is possible to now, you know, um, represent ourselves, <clears throat> be a lesbian, gay, bisexual or transgender, you know. And um, I was fascinated by them. And the character of JJ came out of that. And, you know, it's JJ Vlogs. Mm -hmm. um, she does these monologues to camera, which are the yeah. YouTube monologues, um, which I love those monologues, actually. And um, they represent a time, but they're still timeless, because even if you look at TikTok now, people are doing things like that. Yeah. You know? So yeah. it hasn't aged. The film yeah. hasn't aged. Like you don't look back and think, oh, that was that time. No, you just think it's still happening now. Um, so that, that was the inspiration. Nice. and of course London London is beautiful and the buildings and the people and so you know London inspired it as well in terms of um, so I wanted to ask a bit about um, like I think you know uh, Kamba I'm a really big fan of your short film Desire um, it's one of my favourite short films in, in recent years and that focuses wow. on the appeal of masculine mm. centre people um, do you see the popular image of 
Beto Pinto or of butch people changing? Do you see, because I, as I guess we, we all recognize there would be um, more of a recognized audience for a show called Stud Life, for example. Um, do you see this coming to the fore? There's like, I know there was the article like last week or something, I think in New York Times of, of the butchers and studs of Hollywood, or I'm not sure what it was called, but yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there wasn't a Lena Way 10 years yeah. ago. Um, yes. And, you know, uh, Lena um, is on, you know, unreservedly and unapologetically masculine of center and works in Hollywood and is very successful. So that is incredible. And we have Cheryl Dunier as well, who came out of the indie circuit yeah. and, you know, works in um, mainstream TV now. So that's been progress. That's also America, America. Well, yeah. we're going to talk about the UK. <laughs> um, that's probably a, a, a very, a very different thing. But um, <clears throat> what I do think is that we do Hello. get. Hi. Hi. Back. <laughs> it's fine. Welcome it's fine. Um, we do well, see in images. The farmland. <laughs> in the farms. All the way in Serbia. Uh, we do see masculine of centre um, people. We do see trans people, trans men, and non-binary. They tend to be white, mm. most often yeah. than not, and they tend to have a particular body type that's um, mainstream friendly, which is either quite mask presenting binary ish, quite skinny. It's yeah. a particular kind of aesthetic that I think is very Western um, and it's very hostile to African descent bodies, actually, and not shaped like yeah. that. A lot of times yeah. not shaped like that. So um, it would be good to see diversity of bodies, diversity of ability, like mm -hmm. everybody's able-bodied. And I know, you know, um, for, for historical reasons, um, and everybody's young. So what, what I would like to see is a, a much more diversity because you mm. can't get a situation whereas certain people can have entry-level positions when they're in their 20s and then there are no roles written for them or later yeah. on when they hit their 40s. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And the only roles that last till they're on their deathbed are for cisgender white men. You just can't have yeah. that, you know. Yeah. Um, we've got to accept they're much more the world is diverse and quite frankly people of color are the majority on this planet yeah the majority on this planet so we've got to change our minds from that minority mindset you know we if we think global we are the majority yeah it's true um so ralph <laughs> is asking and maybe um Robin and Tania, you could also, um, you might have more answers for this, I'm not sure, is where would the characters be now, 10 years on? <laughs> what are they? <laughs> You're not, are you together? Um, I don't think they're together. Do you, Robin? I, no, I... Ah, she's frozen again. Oh, no. Um, no, I don't. I don't think they're together. What? I think um, JJ might be a successful, has some success as a as a photographer. Moved on from weddings now and and is exhibiting. Mm -hmm. And I think that she's still got her ally, Seb, played by the wonderful Carl Tresor, yeah. around. Um, and Patch, uh, Patch, she's travelled a bit more, and you know, um, and I'm thinking maybe gone back to school, you know, and. Uh, and I think that probably Elle would have been the push and, and, and perhaps Elle was the one that got away that was just, she just wasn't ready, ready for, um, Elle. for mm. Elle. And I think, we don't know about Elle, we don't know what she's, what, what, what's Elle doing? What's Elle time? doing, Robin? I, I, on a farm. No, I'm joking. On a farm with chickens. <laughs> so, yeah. Probably, I feel like she's, I feel <laughs> like Elle is the kind of um, person who would as long as it was on her terms something on I her just, terms it, as long as it's on her terms what's on her terms 
if she was going to embrace something new, like a complete shift of life, it would have to absolutely be on her terms. And it feels a little bit like if the idea was introduced by someone else, I don't. She just feels so freaking independent and so unapologetic. And I love Elle so much. I don't, it's not that, and this is where I feel like that's why, why JG and Elle didn't work oh. out. And I don't think where they communicate anymore. I think that this was a big, big, big low. They changed each, I think they changed each other the better. Mm. But I feel like Elle doesn't have enough or I, I mean, uh, people evolve, but I don't know. It just felt like she wouldn't be willing to give up certain things. Mm. And and I and I, I I think that she, as a result, and I think it's I I feel like she has that that regret still <laughs> that JJ was the one that that got away. She's so stubborn, pig headed. She's she's so pig-headed that she kind of would cut her nose off to spite her face. Mm. You know, like with their with their, their arguments, like she she just was so rich. She was already ready to believe that JJ wouldn't love her once mm. she told JJ the, the truth. That she had already lived the breakup before the breakup happened. Correct. Correct. He broke her heart and even all of that. She, and and I feel like she still had some evolving to do, and it wasn't up to JJ to fix her. Mm-mm. And That's and I think she realized that fantastic. too late. Yeah, I think I think it's hundred percent accurate. Yes. <laughs> and she well, probably do, and, do, and, 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 and during the pandemic, she'll be texting JJ going, "I miss you." Hi. <laughs> I should have like Zoom sex or something. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Zoom sequel. Zoom um, sequel. <laughs> yeah. That's something. Uh, Simon asks, uh, JJ is definitely not hanging out with that sketcher dealer, I hope. I'm not sure if that's Simon Savory. That's Simon Savory, Smack Jack. Yeah. Hey, Hi, Simon. Simon. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Johnny. <laughs> oh, but that's Simon Savory. Yeah. Oh, Simon. Hi, Simon. Everyone's tuned in. Oh, my God. Oh. Simon. Bless him. Simon was so incredible. You know that car scene where he jumps into the car? <laughs> <laughs> Simon got injured, like his, and he was bleeding, and he kept, and he did it over and over, didn't complain. Simon's a fucking <laughs> star. It's, like, you know, it's all right, just a little cut. Just, like a just a little cut, cut. stop the nonsense. <laughs> just a quite all right, quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> but, mate, you've got a gash in your leg. Oh, so brilliant to work with Simon and continue to. What, what did he ask a question? Oh, he he just question. said that, that um, JJ hopefully isn't hanging out with that sketchy dealer anymore. <laughs> and Stella said he'll be running a legal cannabis factory in Sacramento. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. We'll get oh. together. Um, it's a wonderful family, the Studley family, for real. <laughs> has it ever been a question of, well, now we have the TV show idea, which is maybe a better fit, but was there ever a question of returning to the story um, for you, yeah. Campbell? Yeah, there was. I mean, um, <laughs> ironically, we did pitch it to TV, and they were like, nah. <laughs> aha. Uh-huh. You know, that was a long time ago. Though, that was a long time ago, and you know, you know maybe, maybe we were caught up. You know, there's now pose, so yeah, you can realize there's a market because everything is market driven. So when people think about yeah. things, you know, they they know that there is a people are hungry for this content. People are hungry. Yeah. They're hungry yeah. now. The thing is with you, Campbell. I think is that you're always so ahead of your time yes. with your ideas and, your and it takes 10 years yeah. for the rest of the fucking world to catch up you know yeah, it's not um, my brain it's on fast forward <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so uh, but that's that's you, when whatever you're pitching ideas now just say for 10 years time and the rest <laughs> of the world might be ready yeah <laughs> <laughs> no lies detected 
I think Robin is having some more uh, connectivity problems. Okay. Uh, okay. Hopefully she gets back to us. Um, I'm just seeing a wonderful you Amiga more. at the background working technically. <laughs> well, we this is the, the highest attended of the Peccadillo Sofa Clubs uh, so far. Oh, wow. Thank you <laughs> so much, wonderful people. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. One we, last we thing. It wouldn't be like this if it wasn't for you guys you know, supporting stud life all, all, like all this time, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask just before you guys go, um, what is up next for you? Do you have anything to plug? Do you have anything you're working on? Um, oh, yeah. What are your hopes yes. and dreams? Well, yeah. Campbell, you shoot and then I'll um, I'm developing a documentary. You mentioned which I love um, just recently people um, which I plays a role amazing allows me to create art she's incredible and we've got developing uh, a Parisian uh, producer called Emily and uh, we're working on a feature length documentary um, which I can't say anything more than that but it's going to be hot when um, it, it comes out y'all do love it and um, and I'm working on my next feature with Stella as a producer and um, that's you know so I, I uh, you know, th there's nothing signed on the dotted line, but we're developing ideas in order for me to continue um, directing. And, you know, while on this pandemic thing, I've just thought, you know, I'm using my um, mobile as my webcam. It's so versatile to think of ideas that I can do right on isolation with, with, with my, my uh, smartphone, really, to think outside of the box in that way. We're so, lucky to have it, all of it. I'm very excited. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, I've been really inspired by how people have kind of pulled together in this pandemic, but also how the world's kind of flipped. The people that we didn't value before, suddenly they've come into focus. So mm -hmm. the key workers, the carers, mm. you know, those people collecting the garbage that somehow were invisibilized before become visible and the celebrities they should never have been invisible they should yeah never should be, never yeah, have yeah, been that's, invisible, that's, right? that's, that's, yeah. that's a fucking shame right yeah exactly shame on us you know yeah. and um and now their value is being seen and the people who were revered like the celebrities people are irritated by them you know, every time they do a song, people are like, oh, no, no, I can't take it. Uh, you know, because people are dying and they're these key workers that are working to actually save lives. We're seeing what's really important. And so that flip for me has been really interesting. And I hope we maintain that actually. Yes, it doesn't, doesn't stop on the easing of lockdown. We still value um, people who are very low paid in our society and don't look down on them realize they're actually saving our saving our skin they, they, we keep talking about returning to normal i do not want to return no. to what to, was normal to what was before yeah no. i want to if we like it would be a, i feel like it would be a miracle but you know maybe we're maybe you know Mary, some miracles do happen where we can actually be better from this yeah somehow we have to learn the lessons. I mean, what the fuck is it all for? If it's, yeah. you know, I have my conspiracy to blow up, but regardless of that, um, I think it has generally brought out a kindness in people yes. um, that Absolutely. life crushes don't often allow the everyday person to, it's, you know, just to show. Mm. Um, and I think most of humanity essentially is good. And I, and, and I think that's what's really beautiful about this time, this time of connection mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and care globally. Um, 
And that has to be maintained, surely. Nothing, could, it will never be the same again. Don't believe that. There's, there's no normal. There's there is new. no normal. There's new. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Tania, you're going to say what you're working on, a Robin. Oh, yes. Um, shout What's outs and all that sort of stuff. Right. So, um, really good documentary that came out uh, last Monday on the Vice platform um, is Arranged Gay Marriages, mm. um, run uh, with reporter Rita Loy, um, who runs a company called Gaysians. Gaysians. Um, so, do check out Rita Loy's page and also the Vice, and that can be seen on YouTube and on Facebook as well. So that's a really good documentary to watch at the moment. It's about uh, arranged gay marriages in India, um, and it turns out a scam. scam. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fucking horrific Whoa, scam. Such a yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Sorry. It's such a gotcha piece as well. Yeah, I, I, it was, is. I was really yeah, excited. And it didn't turn out. It didn't start out that way. Yeah. I think over the course of football, over the course of filming, they are. Uh, discovered that it was a scam. Um, so that's a really interesting one one to watch as well. Uh, and personally, well, I mean, what's in the pipeline? Bloody hell. More crochet? <laughs> that's about it. Uh, there is a The Haunting of Bly Manor, which is sort of like the sequel, the sister to The Haunting of Hill House, coming out on Netflix later this year, we think. Um, they're in post-production now so if you like a horror and a love story um it's a it's going to be a good one to watch what about you robin Robin. what's going on things are a bit on hold (laughs) um i i see that show a broadway play uh till the end of last year and with the intention of coming here with my partner who's an artist uh he worked through christmas selling his photography i ended up with a photographer Hmm. (laughs) (laughs) what would al do Yeah. And so our intention was always to come to, we come to Serbia every year to be with uh, his family. And then we were supposed to do Jamaica and then I was supposed to return to New York back to life. But with everything kind of closed down, I don't, you know, I've, I, I every. Bloody hell. Theatre company, um, which had its first production at the end of last year. And I think right now, just trying to figure out what we can do via the internet you know trying to, to think of things that we can do creatively that way um currently they have a project where they oh shit she's gone yeah oh, um, oh dear uh robin you're cutting out again i mean what we might do if she can't come back is we will uh, collect all your shout outs. We'll post them from Fringe and from Peccadillo and, okay. and do a sort of wrap up post. Yeah. Um, so do you have one last thing, actually? I get a lot of um, messages via my Instagram for budding actors coming up in the industry or who want to get out into the industry. And I never feel like I'm always on set or, you know, I'm learning lines. And sometimes I'm doing like 17, 18 hour fucking days and not getting any sleep. So there's not really much time to respond to that, but I will be doing um, either a Zoom thing or a one-to-one sessions. I'll pop by. So keep an eye out for that on my Insta page. My handle's at Tania Miller, which is just my name. Um, if people do want advice about mm. getting into the industry or, you know, uh, whatever it is they want to talk about, you know, how it's what it's like to be an actor and, you know, the ups and the lows and the downs. Um, and what they can expect. So, yeah, keep an eye oh. on my page. For I'll that be tuning in. Fringe that's and Piccadillo. No. Nice. Amazing. That's amazing. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you guys both for joining us. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Um, hopefully, you'll see Thanks, this afterwards. Um, and you guys can tune in to the next uh, Peccadillo Sofa Club, um, which is uh, Juliet Stevenson. Um, Director Andrew Stegel and Alex Lawther, uh, they're from the film Departure.
Um, that's on Thursday, May 14th, and it's hosted by Alex Davidson from the Barbican Centre. Um, you can also check out all of Fringe Queer Film and Arts Fest stuff online, usually at Fringe Film Fest, and all of Peccadillo's new releases. And make sure to follow Campbell X, Ertania, and Robin online as well. See what they're up to. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you, thank darling. You. Thank you, Bye, Martha. Beauty. Thanks, Amelia, for your work <laughs> and peccadillo. Yay!